Welcome to lecture 12 of Experimental Vibration Analysis. In this, the last lecture of the course, we discuss techniques for orthogonalizing signals. This is used in many applications in noise and vibration analysis. And the content of this video is found in chapter 15 of the book, Noise and Vibration Analysis. In this lecture, we will discuss the following topics. We start by talking about the principles of uncorrelated signals. Then we present two ways to produce uncorrelated signals. The first is the eigenvalue decomposition, and the second is the singular value decomposition, or SVD. Eigenvalue decomposition can be used to pr produce something called principal components that is very commonly used in noise and vibration analysis today. Related to the principal components is the concept of virtual signals that we talk about next. And then we also discuss how the uh, topics mentioned here can be used for noise source identification. Think about the input cross spectral matrix GXX. The off diagonal elements in the matrix GXX contains the cross spectra between two respective inputs. A cross spectrum is the Fourier transform of a cross correlation function. If two input signals are uncorrelated then, their respective cross spectrum is zero. Thus, if we could diagonalize GXX somehow, we would have an input cross spectral matrix of uncorrelated signals. Now, how can we achieve that? Well, to find uncorrelated signals, instead of some correlated measured signals, we go from the matrix GXX of the correlated signals to a new matrix G prime XX of some other thought signals X prime. And this G prime XX matrix is diagonal. We now define some variables for the matrix GXX that we will use to diagonalize it. We denote its eigenvalues by lambda k and corresponding eigenvectors uk. Then we put the eigenvectors into columns in the eigenvector matrix, uppercase u. And finally, we define the diagonal eigenvalue matrix, lambda, with the eigenvalues sorted in descending order from the largest to the smallest eigenvalue as indicated here. From linear algebra theory, we have that since GXX is Hermitian and positive, uh, positive semi-definite, we have that the eigenvalues lambda k are real and larger than or equal to zero. The eigenvectors uk can be scaled so that they are orthonormal. That is, they have length equal to one and uk transpose times ul for two different vectors is zero. Furthermore, the eigenvector matrix u is a unitary matrix. This is the complex equivalent of an orthogonal matrix, which means, and for such a matrix, the Hermitian transpose of the matrix equals the inverse. Finally, the Hermitian matrix GXX is diagonalized by GXX times U equals U times lambda, where lambda is the diagonal matrix. This can also be expressed as lambda equals U Hermitian transpose times GXX times U, just by multiplying by u Hermitian transpose from the right. Thus, the eigenvalues diagonalize a Hermitian symmetric matrix. We now define the concept of principal components based on the discussion above. Assume that we have an input cross spectral matrix GXX. We diagonalize this matrix to form the new matrix G prime XX equal to G prime 1 1, G prime 2 2, etc. on the diagonal, 
and zeros on the off diagonal. This is done by the eigenvector matrix U by the multiplication shown here, U Hermitian transpose times GXX times U. This is an eigenvalue decomposition, and you should especially note that this is done for each frequency. To see one of the uses of principal components, we shall look at a case where a system is excited by two forces in a vector f. This corresponds to the previous input vector x. We now just emphasize it, that it's a force by using the letter f instead of x. And we measure three responses in vector y. We then have the equation h times f equals y as the basis. Next, we compute the autospectral density, GYY, as the expected value of Y times the Hermitian transpose of Y. This equals the Hermitian, the expected value of H times F times F Hermitian times H Hermitian, which becomes H times GFF times H Hermitian transpose. If we now look at the eigenvalue decomposition of GFF, it will be GYY equal U lambda U Hermitian transpose. And since GFF only contains two sources, it will only have two eigenvalues. Since we sort the eigenvalues in descending order, it will thus look like this. So we have three eigenvectors, but only two non-zero eigenvalues. This means that the third principal component is zero. We have thus found that principal components can be used to find the number of sources exciting a system by looking at how many principal components are non-zero. A property of principal components is that the sum of the RMS levels are the same as they are in the original matrix. Thus, if the matrix GXX contains PSDs on the diagonal of it with large differences, you will have the same differences in the PCs. So a low principal component does not necessarily mean that there is a limited number of sources. In the plot here, the top plot, you see three accelerometer PSDs. It's actually from a simulated case where only two sources excited the system, but it could as well be from measured data. You see that the three PSD levels are approximately the same level. In the bottom plot, you see the three principal components. Although there is some difference between the first two, the third is certainly much lower. So in this case, the conclusion is that there are two sources. But you probably see that you have to use some judgment when interpreting principal components. Another use of principal components is to reduce the order of the system. In most cases, this is done to suppress measurement noise. This is done in the following way. We start with the full matrix GYY which is decomposed into the full size u and lambda. We then approximate GYY by removing a number of eigenvalues and their corresponding eigenvectors, since the zero eigenvalues will not contribute to GYY. Now in our small example here, we have only removed one of the eigenvalues, but it could as well be more. You should note that each eigenvector uk is still full length, so the size of gyy does not change. In the ideal case, where the lowest eigenvalues are just due to noise, this is an efficient noise reduction method. This is commonly used today in, for example, modal analysis applications. We now turn to another side of principal components, so-called virtual signals. These can be very efficiently used for noise source identification and are used, for example, for transfer path analysis in noise and vibration engineering. Let's assume that we have the DFT blocks of our signals in a vector uppercase X, 
and we make the transformation that a new set of virtual signals x prime are defined as u Hermitian transpose times x, where the matrix u is the eigenvector matrix defined before. If we take the expected value of x prime times x Hermitian conjugate, this by definition is the input cross spectral density matrix of those x prime signals. And some simple calculations give us that it's equal to u Hermitian transpose times gxx times u. You should recognize this equation. Thus, x prime have the principal components as spectral densities. You should also note that the virtual signals are thus uncorrelated, since the matrix g prime xx is diagonal. The eigenvector matrix U can be seen as a MIMO linear system with the virtual signals and as inputs and the actual input signals on the output. You should also note that we cannot measure the virtual signals, but we can estimate their PSDs. And as we will see in the next few slides, also a number of other useful quantities. From the MIMO system in the previous slide, we can define the virtual cross spectral density matrix as the expected value of x times the Hermitian transpose of x prime, which is the expected value of x times the Hermitian transpose of x times u, or simply gxx times u after averaging. So you see, all we need is the input cross spectral density matrix gxx and the eigenvector ma matrix u that we obtain when we compute the principal components. Since we now have the cross spectral densities between the virtual signals and the actual signals, and the PSDs of the virtual signals as well as of the actual signals, we can define coherence functions between the virtual signals and our real signals. Since the virtual signals are uncorrelated, we can use the ordinary coherences between any virtual signal and a measured signal. We call these coherence functions virtual input coherences, and to separate them from ordinary coherences, we denote them by g squared. Thus, g squared pq, the virtual input coherence between xp and x prime q, is the magnitude squared of the virtual cross spectral density gxp x prime q, divided by the PSDs of both signals, that is, gpp and g prime qq. Now, with many measured channels, that are, there are very many combinations of virtual input coherences. So, usually it's more fruitful to use the cumulative virtual input coherences. These are denoted g squared xp x prime q exclamation mark, which should be read like factorial. This means that x prime q exclamation mark is x prime q, where q is 1, 2, up to q. The virtual coherence is thus telling for a single real signal xp, the coherence between this xp signal and the first virtual signal, and then between xp and the two first virtual signals, etc. If we have a MIMO system we, when, where we measure both inputs x and outputs y, we can now extend the picture to the following. Here we can compute virtual coherences between virtual signals and the responses directly. Such virtual coherences are called virtual input-output coherences to stress that they are coherences with the response signals. We will now look at an example of a noise source identification example. This is a simplified example which is designed to illustrate some of the use of virtual signals, etc. Thus, we have a speaker and a plate in the setup. Both these, both these are excited by uncorrelated noise sources. The speaker will thus produce a rather flat spectral density of noise, whereas the plate will produce sound mostly around some of its resonances. 
Now, we measure two signals that we regard as inputs, the accelerometer, X1, and microphone, mic1. And we have one response channel, the mic2 signal. The setup thus schematically looks like this. We have two virtual inputs, X'1 prime and X'2, prime that goes through the system U and forms the measured signals X1 and X2, where X1 is the acceleration and X2 is microphone 1. And then we have one output on the other side of the system H. We need a few words explaining why it's important that we use virtual signals in an application like this. The reason is that the input signals X1 and X2 that we measure are not uncorrelated. We can expect at least a part of microphone 1, the signal X2, to be caused by the sound radiated by the plate. Thus, we cannot use ordinary coherences as the Sources X1 and X2 are correlated. The virtual input signals, on the other hand, are uncorrelated, so we can use ordinary coherences between each virtual input signal and whatever other signal. So we will now look through an actual measurement using the setup previously shown. First, we rank the sources, that is, we use all three sensors and compute the PSDs and the principal components. Already here, we get into trouble. The sensors have different units. This is not an uncommon case in uh, noise source identification. So how can we compare these different units? Well, it turns out in this case that the sensor signals were similar in voltage. So we bypass this problem in this case by comparing the voltages of the signal. On the left hand side you see the spectral densities on, and on the right hand side the principal components. You see on the right hand side that the third principal component is significantly lower than the other two, by which we can conclude that there are only two sources. Actually, this is true except for some sharp peaks around 900 and 1800 hertz, for example. These are tones from the fan of the measurement system that we used in this case. Now we look at the cumulated virtual input-output coherences. That is, the cumulated coherences between the output Y and each of the input of the virtual inputs. The dotted line is the first and the solid line is the first and second. This shows how much of Y that can be explained by the first virtual signal and both virtual signals respectively. You see that at some frequencies we apparently have some other source contributing most a part of Y, such as in this area here. But you also see that in some other areas, a lot of Y, most part of Y, is explained by these two measured inputs. As you can see here, this is a messy plot, which is quite typical for noise source identification examples. But you don't normally look at the entire plot like this. Usually, you are only interested in single frequencies or narrow frequency bands because you have identified some noise problem at a particular frequency. So let's look in detail at a couple such problem frequencies. Let us assume that we have identified a problem at a thousand hertz, as indicated by the error here. Here you see the dotted line be perhaps 0.95 and the solid line is perhaps 0.99 or so. This means that almost all of Y is, is explained here by the first virtual signal. Let's now assume that another problem occurs at 2700 Hz. Here 
you see that the first virtual coherence is low and the second cumulated coherence is high, almost one. So here, the signal Y is apparently explained by the second virtual signal. We will now go on and use these facts. Next, here, we look at the virtual input coherences then. Here in the top plot is the accumulated input coherence with the actual signal X1. And in the bottom plot, the accumulated input coherence for X2. You see that eventually these accumulated coherences sum up to one. And this is since we do explain all of X1 and X2 as a mix of the virtual signals, of course. It's not like for the measured output Y, where we do not necessarily explain everything by the inputs we have measured. We now start at 1000 Hz. As you can see, the first cumulated coherence does not explain anything of X1. So X1 is apparently due to the second virtual coherence. In the bottom plot, we see that the first virtual coherence explains everything. So the first virtual signal thus equals X2 at 1000 Hz. Since the first virtual signal was the entire cause of Y, we conclude that the problem in Y is entirely caused by X2, and X2 is the shaker. So we have identified the source of the problem at 1000 Hz. Next, we turn to 2700 Hz. In the top plot, we see that X1 is caused by X2, the second virtual uh, signal. In the bottom plot, we see that X2 is caused by X1. In this previous slide, we concluded that the output signal Y at 2700 Hz was caused by X2. And thus, Y is caused by X1 in this case, that is, the plate. So, we have now showed an example where we could identify the source at two different frequencies. And of course, we could do the same reasoning at most other frequencies as well. Another useful function is the accumulated virtual coherent power spectrum which is equal to the accumulated virtual input-output coherences times an output signal. These spectra are useful to see how much of the spectrum Y is explained by the first virtual signal, the first and second virtual signals, etc. That concludes our noise source identification example. Next, we will turn to the singular value decomposition. This is a function used very much in noise and vibration analysis today. It's a technique similar to the eigenvalue decomposition, but works. it works also for matrices which are not squared. So the singular value decomposition of any matrix A is U times S times V Hermitian transpose where S is a diagonal matrix which contains the singular values of A on its diagonal. The matrix U is a unitary matrix and its columns are called the left singular vectors of A. Similarly, the, column, the matrix V is also a unitary matrix with the right singular vectors in its columns. Now, a few more facts about the singular value decomposition. If A is an M by N matrix, M rows and N columns, then U is an M by M matrix containing the eigenvectors of A times A Hermitian transpose. S is the same size as A, that is M by N, and contains the square roots of the eigenvalues of A H Hermitian transpose, or if you want, the eigenvalues or square root of the eigenvalues of A Hermitian transpose times A. And finally, the matrix V 
is n by n, the same number of uh, columns as a, and contains the eigenvectors of a Hermitian transpose times a. To illustrate an application of the SVD, which is data compression similar to what we did with eigenvalue decomposition, but now for a rectangular matrix, uh, we will turn to this image. I do this because I think seeing the effect of data compression, compression visually can help you understand the concept of it. So here is an image taken by yours truly in the beautiful Stockholm archipelago a nice calm summer night. The image is quite full of detail in both masts and yacht rigging and in the bushes. Here is a plot of the singular values of this image. You can see how the first singular values are much higher then the values fall off rather constantly although the y scale here is logarithmic so it actually means they fall off quite rapidly. This means that the quality of the image will gradually decrease if we remove the lowest singular values. And there are no zero sing singular values, that is, singular values many orders of magnitude lower than the rest. That is probably because there is so much detail in the image. Back again, for comparison, we go back to the original picture. This picture has 1920 singular values. Now we go to a reduced picture now. This reduced picture has only 300 singular values out of the 1920 original singular values. As you can see the detail in the picture is pretty much still there despite only 10% of the information approximately is kept. And next we go to a hundred singular values. With this hard data reduction, you see that much detail is lost in the image. Particularly note the bushes in the upper left corner, for example, which are now very blurred. If you don't see this clearly in the video here, you can see it more clearly in the print quality in the book. This concludes the current lecture. Now you can go to the book and read the uh, relevant chapter and uh, work through the examples at the end of the uh, chapter. Then you should also go to the chapter examples in the Abravibe toolbox and read through these and run them and make sure that you understand all the steps involved. If you haven't yet downloaded the toolbox, you sh should do so at www.abravibe.com. Welcome back to the next lecture when you have worked through this.